Hey, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to tonight's amazing event with Leslie Epstein for the deb debut of his new book, Hill of Beans. My name is Adam, and I'm an events host and bookseller at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, whether you know our store well or have never heard our name before, we are thrilled to welcome you into our community tonight. I'd like to first thank all of you for choosing to support Leslie and an independent bookstore with your presence. So thank you so much. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of nuts and bolts. Uh, the chat and Q&A box found at the bottom of your Zoom window are both open, so feel free to make use of those. There will be an audience Q&A, and we know you've got some good questions, uh, so feel free. Please note that Brookline Booksmith has a strict policy uh, against abusive behavior I mean. <laughs> and language at our discretion. Any attendee can be removed from an event for partaking in such behavior. I am absolutely thrilled to have with us tonight two amazing authors to discuss Philippines, the author himself, Leslie Epstein. And he's he's author. back. My, my wife's having trouble. <laughs> <laughs> a little complication here. And uh, fellow author A.S. Hamra. Uh, A.S., who is serving as our moderator tonight, moderator tonight, is a Brooklyn area writer and currently the film critic for The Baffler. He also contributed a column on film to N Plus One from 2008 to 2019. And his essays and reviews have appeared in Harper's, Book Forum, Cine East, and other publications. A collection of his work, The Earth Dies Streaming, Film Writing 2002-2018, has recently been released. The Earth Dies Streaming is available for purchase directly through M Plus One Books, and I'll be providing a link for that in the chat. Uh, thank you so much, Ash, for being here. Thank you very much, Adam. I'm great. It's great to be here with uh, Leslie for his new novel. Definitely. Uh, and then we have the man himself, Leslie Epstein. Leslie is an award-winning author who has written 11 other books of fiction, including the celebrated novel San Reno, Remo Drive and King of the Jews. He teaches at Boston University, where he directed the creative writing program for 36 years. I'm so happy to have Leslie here with us tonight. I've been so excited for this event and for this book. Many people have been. It just got a wonderful, wonderful review on WBUR. I'll be dropping a link to that in the chat as well, so you should definitely check it out. Ladies and gentlemen, without further delay, A.S. Hamra and Leslie Epstein. Hi, Leslie. It's nice to see you in person on Zoom. Hi, Scott. And, and I was uh, very happy to read your book over the last uh, couple of weeks. It's called Hill of Beans, of course, from the last line or one of the last lines in the movie Casablanca, which was written by your father and your uncle in 1942. Is that right? That's right. And so it, the book is a kind of irreverent, fictionalized telling of the story of the making of Casablanca, not through the eyes of the stars of the film, uh, Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman, nor through the eyes of the director, uh, Michael Curtiz, nor really even through your father and your uncle, but more through the eyes of Jack Warner, the head of Warner Brothers at the time with his brother, and through historical figures who become involved in the story, like Franklin Delano Roosevelt and uh, Stalin and Joseph Goebbels, and I was wondering how you decided to have this multi-narrated book that's essentially a comic novel, not what people I think would expect if they knew that you, being the son of and, and, the, and the nephew of the two writers, would necessarily write. Well, Scott, let me, let me begin first by thanking you for agreeing to do this. And I, I want to tell those uh, who are watching that I'm reading through Scott's book. Um, and here it is. I don't know if you can see it, but it's quite wonderful. He has a wonderful prose style, lively, jaunty, uh, quirky, uh, and I, as I told him, sort of uh, an oddly sincere um, and compelling style. I'm having a great time reading it. Thank I you. I want to thank the uh, booksmith as well. It's been my bookstore uh, since we moved here in 1978. So uh, it's a long time and a lot of books <laughs> have gone by. And then uh, I can't see anybody who's here, but I'd like to thank um, uh, my friends and, um, and strangers as well who are, are here at the event. Um, Scott, before I answer your question, was I not going to read something first before? Oh yes, we're gonna do a reading first. That's right, I forgot, I'm sorry. I jumped in just like the way Casablanca, the movie, starts so quickly. <laughs> um, so what I think I will do is um, read a very brief four or five minute little chapter in the book now, 
And at the very end, when your questions, and I hope you'll have a lot of them for, uh, uh, for Scott and myself, when they peter out, uh, and before I peter out, I'll read an even briefer uh, section from the end of the book involving my uncle and my father, so you can get some sense of them uh, from, from both horses' mouths, as it were. Um, so I, I'll set up this little brief re reading by saying the, each, uh, throughout the novel, there's a different speaker. No, uh, there's no author, no narrator. It's Jack Warner's voice, General Patton's voice, Hitler's voice, <laughs> Goebbels' voice, Stalin's voice, Hedda Hopper's voice, the voice of the one friend Jack ever had in his life, uh, his Masur Abdul Maljan. And this particular voice is by a, a German-American woman named Carolina Kaiser. Her father worked for Jack Moore, Warner in real life. Uh, Joe Kaufman worked for Jack Warner. Um, he was persecuted by the Germans and fled. In my book, he kills himself. And Carolina escapes to America after having liaison, very difficult liaisons with people in Germany. She comes to America. She ends up Jack's mistress after, and this is about almost a year after she's arrived. The situation is that um, in order, it's a technicality, in order to uh, be eligible for the Academy Awards, the movie Casablanca had to be shown in 1942. So they rushed a quick showing in New York at a crummy theater called the Hollywood Theater on Avenue A in New York. And that's all you have to know as this begins. And Carolina is speaking to us. Uh, this was published separately. It's called Jack Warner Explains Thanksgiving. It was published on Thanksgiving Day. So there I was, November 26th, 1942, stuck in a New York hotel with Jack Warner, waiting for the premiere of his latest picture. Hey, Jack yelled, don't call it a premiere. It's not even a regular showing. What it is, is a technicality. We've got to open for a couple days to be eligible for the Academy Awards. Not that this dog is gonna win anything, fat chance. My money is on murder in the big house, born for trouble, or this terrific new the mysterious doctor picture. Even I got the heebie-jeebies at the rushes. There's this guy, see, in the tin mines, and I swear to God, he's got no head. No head. How do they do that? It's genius. It's what I call movie making. Murder stalks in the moors. Not only that, it's under budget. Say, look at the time. Will you hurry up and throw on some clothes? We came all the way across the country, right? to see this phony premiere, so get a move on, will you? 10 minutes later, Jack was dragging me through the lobby of the St. Regis Hotel. Hey, taxi, he yelled. And as if we were on the Burbank lot, three yellow cabs came to a halt at the same time. He pushed me through the door of the first one and leaned toward the driver. Get us to Avenue A. We pulled up in front of the Hollywood Theater. There were no searchlights, there were no crowds. The B in the word Casablanca was placed backward on the marquee. And by the way, it really was. <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen pictures of that premiere. A redhead sat in the ticket booth. Jack looked through the glass at her pale, freckled skin. Guess what, said Jack. You ought to be in the movies. Guess what, said the girl. I already am. That'll be six dollars. Six dollars? American money? You've got to be kidding. That's some, uh, that's some, uh, wait a second, three dollars each. Highway robbery. Do you know who I am? My name is on the water tower and my name's on the two dollar bill. Who writes your material? The Epstein boys? Hey, you wouldn't be free later on to, look mister, do you want to see the picture or don't you? Other people are waiting. So they were. Four or five men and women now stood behind us. Jack pulled me out of the line. Don't waste your money, he told them. Bogart goes off with reins. Henri, don't ask me why, gets the girl. Behind us from inside the booth, the girl cried out, Happy Thanksgiving. What did she say? I asked. 
You got here last December, right? You poor kid, you don't even know about our beloved holiday. Come with me. You're going to have the biggest feast of your life, and it's going to be on me. We walked over to, second a to the Second Avenue Automat, where we got rolls and desserts from little glass windows and hot turkey specials from the steam table. Coffee came out of dolphins' mouths. Okay, said Jack, as we took our seats. You got to have turkey. It's a tradition. By the way, Maxime says nothing on Horn and Hardart. There were these pilgrims, see? You know, these guys with buckles and funny looking hats. They were the victims of religious prejudice, which went on in those days, just like now. So after a lot of persecution, like frogs and hail, they went 40 days in the desert with nothing to eat but stale bread and finally crossed the Red Sea on the Mayflower, the same name as the hotel. Where was I? The turkey. Delicious, in my opinion, with these mashed potatoes. Hey, I forgot the cranberry sauce. Well, the reason we eat turkey is because the pilgrims were starving, the way I said, and they had barely escaped from the pharaoh, and it was the Indians who showed them how to plant corn with fish, which wasn't so digestible. They were like bitter herbs. So then they brought them these turkeys, the breast meat, the drumsticks, the works, and everybody was so happy, they danced around the golden calf and bought the whole island of Manhattan for bupkis. And that is why we ask, why is this day so special? And don't mix milk with meat. Notice there isn't any cream in that coffee. And count our blessings. And to grandmother's house, we must go. He finished his plate and started to mop up the gravy on mine. His mouth was full, but he kept on talking. That's Americana, as you Krauts are going to find out when we get to Berlin. And I'll tell you something else. There was this guy, John Smith, if you can believe a name like that, in love with a lovely Indian maiden, think Lena Horne. And if it weren't for the color line, are you gonna finish that pumpkin pie? Which someday I have the dream to challenge once I can talk Harry into it. Well, then we're going to make this tremendous vehicle, a colossal picture, all about it. He dared to love as no man had before. She left her tribe to follow her heart. Forget about all that crap that's playing at the Hollywood theater now. A love story as old as America itself. Outside, Jack hailed another taxi. This time, four of them jostled for position around us. The St. Regis, he told the lucky driver, and make it snappy. Before we turned the first cor corner, he had his hand on my knee. Come here, Pocahontas. His other hand was on my neck. This is how we celebrate in America. The same as in the desert for, I don't know, maybe 5,000 years. So that's the end of that little chapter. And your question was, <laughs> Scott? <laughs> well, that, 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 that scene, which takes place in an automat, which maybe, I, maybe some people uh, who are joining us tonight don't really know what an automat is, um, but it was a place where you could get a cafeteria-style restaurant where you could get food out of little glass compartments, right? Right. That um, scene is, is a collage where you mix up all these different holidays and different American traditions and Jewish traditions together into one big kind of meal that he's explaining to, that Jack Warner is explaining to this woman who's, a, who's an actress from Germany. And it's kind of like how, it kind of replicates how films were made themselves. By by the by Warner Brothers and by other people in Hollywood at that time by just fifty a year, yeah, right on a production line. Exactly, they they they're they're making all these things at once, and Casablanca was kind of made that way too, right? Very much so. Yeah, almost not made that way. <laughs> they couldn't, as so, you know, they couldn't think of the ending and so forth. Right, and and so finally, you know, finally it was made and it came out and it did very well and won an Oscar, and. Um, you know, it, it was made with a lot of people from different countries. Only three of the actors in that big cast are Americans, I guess. And I was wondering how your father and um, your uncle got involved in writing that. Was it just a contract job that they had to do a certain amount of e films a year? Or was, was there some special affinity that they had for that particular screenplay? It was just a contract job. And uh, they, uh, they were handed the assignment. And they started to write the assignment. And then days later, uh, Pearl Harbor occurred and they, and they flew off to Washington DC with Frank Capra to write the Why We Fight series 
in Washington, but they continued to work on the book while they were uh, in, in DC. And meanwhile, Jack had hired Howard Koch and then they, uh, to work on it. They came back, Julie says they tore up Koch's stuff and continued on themselves through the, through the end of the movie. And in, in Pearl Harbor Day is a scene in the book that takes place in your novel in Union Station. Right. right. When mm -hmm. Jack Warner is um, there to greet the actress who he's having a Thanksgiving dinner with in New York City in the That's scene right. you just read. That's right. So I was wondering, maybe you should tell people who are here the story of your uncle and your father and how they became screenwriters in Hollywood at Warner Brothers. Well, uh, they graduated from Penn State where they were both on the boxing team. Julie was captain of the boxing team. And uh, they got a job as publicists. Uh, they were publicists for Fatty Arbuckle at one point. He needed um, one. A, a great comic actor who had a disastrous end to his career, very unfairly persecuted, I think, in, in Hollywood. Uh, my father claimed he played the rear end of a horse. That was his acting career. <laughs> On, uh, on Broadway. Julie came out to Hollywood uh, first. And um, the book, What Makes Sammy Run, uh, is really about uh, the act, uh, the writer Julian is my uncle Julie. He would yeah. sit in the valley and write a uh, treatment a night and hand it to his Penn State pal, Jerry Wald. And uh, Jerry would uh, at the lunch break, say, I got it. We're going to take a lunch break. He'd run over to Julie, get, get the treatment, run back. And they say, Jerry, you're a genius. <laughs> and this went on for a year or so until Julie demanded credit. And I think the first one was Living on Velvet. Uh, it was Julie's first screen, screen credit. My father came to RKO first, where he did 16 scenes of The Big Sleep, oh. including the famous horse race scene and um, with Lauren Bacall. And, um, and then they joined forces. Julie, meanwhile, had gotten an Academy Award nomination on his own for four daughters. Mm. Then they joined forces together and uh, had an enormously successful career together. My father died very young, but nonetheless, they wrote so many terrific films for Warner Brothers. Well, the big Julie went on to have a great career afterward on his own. Right. And wasn't the, the Big Sleep was a Warner Brothers film that came out in 1946? So that must have been an early, an earlier iteration of that. Oh, project. I, I, I'm just no, I'm probably just confused. But okay. I know that my, uh, my father got no credit until there was a big to do at UCLA, where uh, at a meeting it was revealed that he did it, and then from then on in movie books and things, you'll see that he got credit for that. The same thing happened with Yankee Doodle Dandy. Um, uh, they were called in, they were script doctors sometimes, mm. and they got no credit for that. In fact, uh, my uncle and father handed it to a friend of theirs who needed a credit. Mm. And Jimmy Cagney took an ad out in, um, in Variety, saying that Julie and Phil deserve the credit for writing the script. And in the good movie books, you'll see uh, that um, they are given credit for Yankee Doodle Dandy after that. In, in your novel, I think there are seven different films that they wrote uh, that, that are mentioned in the novel in various ways without necessarily crediting them for writing them. Because you work in so much Hollywood lore into the book with such deafness and, you know, um, you know, without even making the reader know what you're doing. It's all very savvy and uh, it's, so, so, it's done so wittily and with, with such skill that you know, the reader doesn't really understand what's happening a lot of the time in the book in terms of fitting these things in from Hollywood in the 40s. There are often references to Warner Brothers films that were being made at the time. It's all done with such, you're juggling a lot of balls with such dexterity in it. Well, thank you. I mean, in uh, the way a book is a tribute to a certain age in Hollywood long past. And so, you know, your, your father and your uncle are characters in the book but they don't really narrate the book the way that Jack Warner does. And in, in fact, Jack Warner is really the, really the star of the book. And he's this kind of comical, foolish man that actually does end up doing things that are great. And it's interesting to note that Jack Warner was really the only studio head that stood up to the Nazis. And he did it pretty early too. 
You talk about the making of the movie Confessions of a Nazi Spy uh, near the beginning of the book. And I was wondering, you know, what you, why do you think Jack Warner was like that and other studio heads were not? Because he was a fool in yes. some ways, a courageous fool. You know, my father and uncle uh, uh, um, appear and disappear in the book as a kind of Greek chorus, I think, a witty and I hope sometimes wise Greek chorus who see right through Jack all the time. Yes, they're, they're, they needle him frequently. They mock him. Yeah. As they did in life, and many of the many of those scenes are just taken from life. That's rather famous in Hollywood um, conflicts between between Jack and the Epstein boys, and all the way through the book, he's cursing the Epstein boys, as you see in that little scene I I just read. Uh, Jack himself, I went into the book with the same attitude that my father and uncle did, which is a basically hatred. <laughs> Uh, he's a terrible man in many ways, racist, misogynist, um, supercilious, arrogant. Um, but the more I read about him and the more that he took over my voice, I would say, rather than the other way around, the more I came to a kind of grudging acknowledgement of uh, a kind of greatness. Um, as you said, Scott, when Goebbels... Came, uh, when Hitler took over in 33, right away, one of the first things Goebbels did was demand that every Hollywood studio fire every Jewish employee in Berlin that they had. And they all happily did it, right? And Paramount uh, did it and kept its offices open up until Pearl Arbor, <laughs> to their shame. Jack Warner said to hell with it. And he closed his office in 1934 uh, even though it was the second biggest market in Europe and he hated to lose money, but uh, he closed his office. And then as you pointed out, Scott, he, he did make Confessions of a Nazi Spy, a movie that Goebbels admired tremendously as a propaganda piece, but banned wherever the Reich took over a country. In fact, he hanged the uh, owner of a Warsaw theater, which dared to show the film. So Jack, is, um, you know, uh, in these times, it's hard for some people to read about a character like Jack, who's sort of openly racist, openly misogynist, terrible in many ways, but a human being, and therefore complex with many sides. And he was, of all the Hollywood people, the most courageous in standing up to it. Ben Hecht would be his only rival in all of Hollywood. It's and Hecht had, Hecht had no money to lose. Jack had a lot of money too. And he, and he almost in some ways lost his life. The uh, German uh, underground uh, led by the German consul in Los Angeles um, tried to disrupt that movie. Ever G. Robinson was almost killed on the set when a sandbag was cut and fell right before him. And, they, and they were, they, Jack had to dig up his lawn because there were talks of bombs on it. So what am I to feel? Uh, his sheer, the other thing I admired about him is his inexhaustible energy, his insouciance, his, his, uh, the force of carelessness in a way. Um, my favorite line about him, he said in real life, he said, and it, it's true, he says, I'm so smart, I can make money from a good movie. Yeah, that's one of that. That line comes up in the book a couple of times. Yeah. I'd never heard that before. That's very good. It, it's a wonderful line, and it's true. And, and it, which is not to say that Jack Warner is uh, portrayed as a, as a heroic figure in the book, not at all. He is, he is kind of like um, Bob Hope in a, in a Bob Hope movie in a way. He, he's kind of a coward who, who is a liar, who takes credit for things he didn't do, who's having affairs with multiple women, even though he's married, who you know uh, promises things to these women that he does not deliver who uh, casts his uh, stepdaughter famously in the role of Anina, the Bulgarian refugee in, in Casablanca. And, um, you know, the book is very racy even. It's not a glowing portrait of Jack Warner. And so I think it's unique in, in uh, novels about Hollywood and the way that it uh, handles him and then puts him in contact with Stalin and Franklin Delano Roosevelt and you know, major figures that evidently, I mean, I don't know if the Stalin part is, is that true that he met Stalin? Like no, that? That, that part is not true. Okay. 
I didn't look it up. But yeah. the parts about Roosevelt are largely well. They true. knew they knew each other, but um, where Jack begs, bribes, cajoles, and ultimately blackmails FDR into invading Morocco at a time that will be uh, most advantageous to Warner Brothers and the launching of Casablanca. That's right. One, that's, of, one of the sorry didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, uh, uh, that part is that part is not true. I an awful lot of the novel is, and as you'll hear at the end when I read again, a lot of the novel is really uh, true. I mean, Goebbels' own words, General Patton. General Patton is worse than Warner. Yeah, Patton is a major character in the book and very funny, but also quite terrifying in a way. Yeah, uh, a great general, terrible human being, worse human being than Jack in terms of his racism, anti-Semitism, and all the rest. Um, but they're his words, they're Jack's, a lot of it are Jack's words, they're Goebbels' words, some of it is Stalin's words, sometimes Hitler's words. Um, so it's a mixture I, I try and bring together in the way you describe Hollywood films being brought together in those days. I tried to bring together what really happened and what took over my imagination in the course of doing the book. There's a, the book and the book starts, you, you refer to the man who was the head of the office in Berlin who was Jewish. Uh, the book starts kind of tragically with a double, with two suicides. And um, somehow this does not affect the comic tone of the book, even though it's dealing with very serious things, especially that section where, you know, he, um, you know, he kills himself. But this kind of sets the plot in motion. Yes, uh, the other person who killed himself near the beginning, and it sort of flash forward is Goebbels himself. Um, and the book ends with a suicide as well. I won't. I won't go into that. I don't want to ruin the. I don't want to ruin the book. But you know, it turns out, Scott. I have no choice. Uh, this happened to me when writing King of the Jews. I mean, what could be more serious and tragic than the Holocaust and the and the people who suffered? Two hundred thousand people killed in the Woj ghetto. And I started to write it, and you know. <laughs> In the winter of 1918, 1919, on a day when the wind was blowing, I see Trumpelman arrived in our town. Mm -hmm. And I stopped writing. I said, I can't write a book in that jaunty tone. Um, and I started it again every which way. But that was my voice for that book. And it turned out, that even though I'm dealing with terribly serious things in this book, it's my voice which intrudes in the voices of those who actually speak in the vo a book. So it is simply part of me that sees history that way. And tragically, that story of the man who was fired in Warsaw just for showing that movie, he, I guess, hanged himself or he was hanged by the Nazis in his own movie theater that he ran. That's right. Was that part of what inspired you to write the suicide scene with Kaufman? No, it's not. I mean, hanging himself in his own movie theater, that's an example of, of uh, fascist humor. <laughs> They, they would think that was very appropriate and humorous. No, I, I knew that this man, Joe Kaufman, in real life had been persecuted. And it was one of the reasons, and he fled for his life. He did not take his life. He fled to Sweden, uh, where he died um, very shortly afterward. But he was beaten on the street, attacked by dogs in the street. His flat was ransacked. And um, that's one of the reasons, give Jack Warner credit. It's one of the reasons Jack said, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna stand for this. I'm closing all our offices rather than put up with this kind of thing from the Germans. I remember when uh, Inglorious Bastards came out in 2009, Quentin Tarantino also talked about uh, the fact that Jack Warner was the only person that really stood up to the Nazis. And then that book was written about Hollywood collaborators in 2015 that the Harvard University Press published. Uh, I, I mean, did, did Jack Warner totally escape censure for this kind of thing? Was he completely clean in his, in his opposition to the Nazis? Uh, uh, th does that let him off the hook? The answer is yes and no. Yes, more than anyone else. Uh, let's put it this way. In all of World War II, no film about American life from 41 to 45 mentions the word Jewish or Jew made in, made in Hollywood, except for one. And that one is uh, Mr. Skeffington, um, which Claude Rains tells his daughter that she should live with his 
uh, uh, ex-wife, Betty Davis, because you see, dear, he tells her, I'm Jewish and things will be easier for you. Well, that film is a Warner Brothers film, but it was produced by Julius and Philip Epstein mm. <laughs> and, who, and who also wrote it. So they had the guts to do it, Jack Warner, and Jack Warner put up with it, right? That even if you see before the war, if you see the life of Emil Zola, no one says, <laughs> no one says that poor Dreyfus was a Jew, right? Mm. If you glance down on a piece of paper, you'll see the word in, in a millisecond, right? You have to have a Jewish nose to, to know that it's there. Uh -huh. So no one gets off. The, the, the Jews of Hollywood um, behave badly during World War II, as, as did as... <laughs> As did as they did nationally in many ways, and and didn't Warner Brothers make some films that were later considered pro-Soviet that got them into trouble with HUAC? Oh, Mission to Moscow uh, would be one of them, and there's another one that has I think snow in the title or something. Uh, that's right. Um, uh, w the one reason I know that Howard Koch didn't really do much on Casablanca is that he wrote Mission to Moscow, and it's such a lousy film <laughs> on, on top of everything else that uh, uh, it answers any questions, lingering questions for me about authorship. Huh. Was Howard Koch one of the Hollywood Ten? No, no. I, okay, but but he he was he was called before Huac, I believe, as were your father and uncle. Well, let's wait till the end of this uh, 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 evening together because I'm going to read. A, okay. I'm going to read from that. So the the other character who's very prominent in the novel is uh, Abdul Maljean. Maljan. I wasn't sure how to pronounce it properly. Well, uh, I'm not Turkish either, so let's say Mal, Mal, uh, Maljan. Let's say okay. that. All right. And he's known as the terrible Turk because he was a professional fighter at, in the early part of the century before he went to work for Warner Brothers as Jack Warner's kind of man Friday, or he was his masseuse, but he was more than that. He was kind of a fixer in some ways. Well, and he, you know, he, he's, he's one of the, he's kind of a, he's a more insightful person than Jack Warner in your novel and a more sensitive person. Yet he's not uh, seen by other people that way. He's seen more as a tough guy, I guess. How did you decide to include him so prominently? I came across him. I thought, I, th I thought the book needed a thoroughly nice man. And uh, he, he's a real figure. He was a boxer. Uh, he came close to winning a title once. Uh, gave up his uh, career in the ring, though he picks it up again in the novel and fights Julian Phil in the ring on a war bonds drive to raise money. Um, I would say that he was the best, if not the only friend that Jack Warner ever had. And... Uh, when when Abdul died, he left his estate to Jack, and when Jack died, he left part of his estate to a home for uh, for lost and and destitute boxers. So there was a real friendship there, and his voice goes all through the novel as well. He's one of the key narrators, and I think you can trust what he says in the book. Yes, and I guess he's the only non-famous narrator in your book besides the character of. Carolina, the German-American actress, who really kind of sets the book in motion. But were you thinking of anyone in particular when you invented her? No, I, I, I had no movie actress model uh, in, in mind for her. Uh, she's a beautiful young German actress. Um, there were some other women. There's a woman, Renata, I forget her last name, who was a delightful um, comedian and singer in early German films. She had a relationship with Hitler. You know, Hitler had relationships with seven or eight women and uh, all of them either committed suicide or tried to. And I tried to get to the bottom of that with Carolina, who has a one night liaison with Hitler and has this terrible secret. Um, but I didn't base her particularly on Renata or any of the other women. One of the Mitford sisters is one of them, a German woman named Mitzi, right up through Eva Braun, who, oh, of course, in her way, who did commit suicide for different reasons. So something terrible about Hitler that these women knew. And I tried to, I tried to explore that through the character of Carolina. It's a terrible secret that she has and that really destroys her life um, from that moment on. 
Yes, uh, that scene is quite harrowing and grotesque, but it's uh, initially presented as a, uh, well, I don't want to ruin it for people who haven't read the book. But it's again, it's something that's handled very deftly and in an unexpected way in your novel. Um, I forgot that the fascist Mitford sister makes a brief appearance in the book too. That's right, I remember that now. Yeah, I, I try and bring in a, a few of these women um, to, to, to buttress my point about what is the terrible thing that they knew about, that they and only they knew about Hitler, includes Hitler's niece, Jelly Robble. Oh, who committed, yes. Who committed suicide as well. What was what was that? What did they know about this great, great German leader that no one else did? Well, uh, this, the Secret Service in America thought they knew. And I, I base what I say about him and hint more than hint about him on those ISS reports. Yeah, that was a news story a few years ago. I remember reading about it in the New York Post. It's uh, quite... Uh, well, where uh, else? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, to lighten the mood, I guess, there's a lot of stuff in the book about the movie The Man Who Came to Dinner, which your father and uncle also wrote, based on the Broadway play, and in which um, Jimmy Durante appears as a character based on Harpo Marx. And then in your novel, Harpo Marx appears a couple of times, and, and quite, quite prominently in one scene. I love Harpo Marx. I recommend to everybody his book called Harpo Speaks. It's one of the great Hollywood, uh, in fact, it's one of the great biographies. And I have a lot of uh, feeling for him. I, I never met him. I did meet Groucho. Um, he said, oh, I'm Marx Brothers fan, eh? Uh, <laughs> I met him at a tennis match with my uncle. Um, but I, I, uh, Harpo is a very lovable and admirable figure. And, and when you read Harpo Speaks, which you can, I'm sure can get at the Brookline Booksmith, um, you'll, you'll know why he plays a role in this book. Harpo in real life was appointed by Franklin Roosevelt as in a way the first ambassador to the Soviet Union. Yep. He went there before there was an actual ambassador to spread goodwill in the Soviet Union. And conversely, a relative of mine on my mother's side, Maxim Litvinov, was the Russian ambassador to the United States. And in that chapter with the uh, man who came to dinner, Litvinov plays a role uh, in the novel. So I bring in more relatives <laughs> than just my uncle and father. Uh, the story of Harpo Marx going to the Soviet Union to be kind of a, an ambassador of Americanness to this country is, you know, I, I, had, I had read mention of that before, but I never had, you know, heard, heard about it very much. That's a very odd story. Um, but Harpo doesn't. What, what could be a more American story than that, yeah. right? Than F, FDR coming in and then combining Hollywood and a figure, you know, uh, like Harpo. But he knew what a quality person Harpo, what a wonderful person Harpo was. And, sent, and then, you know, Republicans went nuts. Are you going to recognize the Soviet Union? Well, he was going to recognize the Soviet Union, but he had to soften the blow in a way. And so he sent Harpo as that intermediary first. And you know, of course, Harpo doesn't speak in the book, just like as he just like he doesn't speak in the movies. Right. He could speak, but you don't you don't portray him as talking to anyone. But then at the end, we do hear from Groucho, and I guess we'll get to that when we talk about Hueck. But um, you know, there's so many people in the book. It's good that you have kind of an index at the end that lists <laughs> all the characters in the book because there are so many. And, and all also, the movies. <laughs> yes, and also all the films that are mentioned in the book. Uh, you know, even even obscure Russian documentaries uh, are included in that index. I love an index in a book, you know, even an, even a fiction, even a work of fiction, it's fantastic. Yeah. Well, it truly is meant to be what the subtitle says, a book about war and celluloid. And, and uh, so there are over a hundred movies mentioned, many of them just in passing, but I thought as a kind of tribute, I would let them all uh, uh, find their way into print. And when you mention them, it's not like you're checking them off a list or they're just mentioned for yeah. sentimental reasons at all. Every mention of a movie or a person is there for a reason and it's funny and it's unexpected and it works. It's not, um, you know, this, this is a book that I think would please film buffs, but it's not meant to be a film buff book at all, really. No, I would be upset if it were just a book for film buffs. Right. Or World War II buffs for that matter. Yeah, right, right. Or, yes. I mean, it's so, it's so, the things that happen are so unexpected. I'm trying to think of what other characters I've, I've missed uh, mentioning. I have, uh, 
I've got a uh, advanced reading copy of the book in front of me from the publisher, but um, I'm not sure what how much time we have. Oh, we're we're good. Hedda Hopper has a. Oh, yes. So so that's Hedda Hopper is a very important person in the book, and of course, uh, you know, history has shown that Hedda Hopper was not a good person. She was very right wing, and. Um, I liked how you got the German word for her hat style into the book, which I can't remember now. What was the word? What was that word? I don't know. Uh, 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 let's just say it was a, a Kumpfelfucken, yeah. which is, uh, which is a, a kind of a pastry, a big German pastry. <laughs> so to what extent was Hedda Hopper actually, you know, you, you essentially portray Hedda Hopper as a spy and an informer. You know, is there any, what kind of truth is in that portrayal? Well, to me, she was only uh, uh, this much truth. She, from my FDR uh, point of view, a betrayer of American ideals, right? But she never betrayed this country as a, once, once the war began, yeah, she turned on a dime, of course. But up until the war, it was how wonderful Germany is, what a lovely man Hitler is. Um, when uh, uh, um, what's her name, Lena von uh, uh, Triumph of the Will? What's her name? Lady Riefenstahl. When Riefenstahl came to Hollywood um, in 1938, I think it was, and none of the I'll say this for the studio people none of them would see her or allow her in, uh, except for another bum. Walt Disney, mm. who thought Germany was just a cat's pajamas, a wonderful place. But Hedda Hopper says, shame on everybody for not having this wonderful woman, Lenny von Riefenstahl, <laughs> uh, welcome, in, welcome in Hollywood. So that's the kind of person she was. So I, she's a figure of parody in the book. I parody her language. Um, and I stretch her attitudes as not turning on a dime. Yes, in her columns, she says, come on, boys, we, we, you know, let's fight. You know, the Yanks have to fight. But behind the scenes, she, in her comms, is giving secret codes uh, to Goebbels. Um, perhaps unfair to her, but not unfair to um, the kind of person she was underneath, I think. Well, other Hollywood Republicans are shown in the book as being, um, you know, uh, not fans of Roosevelt as well. Yeah. I can't remember the character now, but the woman that they rent the house from in Morocco is also... Yeah, what a head of pal. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have never been a fan of the Republican Party. And of course, nowadays, uh, no one is. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I won't say, I know, some of my pals in the audience there I know are. But the um, Republican Party has some big decisions to make about what they're going to be. Yes, well, that is certainly true. I think they're having a little trouble figuring that out. Um, the, the Terrible Turk, however, is uh, shown in your book as someone who had has had an affair with Hedda Hopper in his in his in his long almost forgotten past. Yeah, as who has not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know she tries to use that to her advantage in the book when when uh, smearing, when kind of criticizing Roosevelt and trying to find out what's going on. Yeah, I mean her her portrayal in the book is perhaps the most damning one of someone who's not an actual Nazi in Berlin. Well. Um, I, I, I see her as a figure to be, to be parodied and ridiculed. It's true. So should we start with the questions? I don't know. We're getting sure, there, there seem to be, why don't you just pick that, pick out one you like. I've never seen so many. Here's you Adam. Wanna, do you want to do the questions, Scott, or do you want me to do them? Well, have you, I haven't scrolled through them. I've just seen them showing up and I noticed there's a lot of them. Did you scroll through them already? Yeah, I got a couple. Yeah, there's oh, some great questions in here. Um, okay. So a uh, question for um, Leslie, Professor Epstein, have you taught writing students at BU? Whose work do you admire? And if so, uh, who? Whose work uh, among my students at BU or whose work in general do I admire? Is that clear? Um, I think it's students, but I think maybe in general, um, whose well, work do you well. really admire? I think, well. I think the person means what students have you taught that you went on to admire as writers? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Jhumpa Lahari, of course, Ha Jin, of course, uh, uh, many others uh, who are, have become, but I think will become equally famous. One uh, about to publish, Emma Campione, 
Um, Waiki Wang had a very successful book called Chemistry out a few years ago. Um, Sue Miller at the very beginning of my teaching has gone on to a fine career. Arthur Golden published uh, a book, uh, Memoirs of a Geisha, I believe it's called. It's a very, very fine book. So if you mean just the, just the students, I've had uh, an awful lot of them. Um, but those are the ones who come immediately to mind. Awesome. That's a, that's a pretty good list. <laughs> um, was Warner more progressive than the other studio heads in the 30s and 40s? Uh, weren't Warner's big FDR boosters early on, um, as seen in the Berkeley Forgotten Man number, for instance? Warner was, a, was a, they were all Republicans, but he was also, a, uh, you know, palsy. They all had to be palsy with whoever was in power. Um, but he was a Republican. Um, they knew where their bread was buttered. And, uh, and so they sliced it and ate it. And um, yeah, they, they were, you know, Ma Luigi Mayer was a famous Republican. Uh, the one, um, who was it who started Universal? Uh, um, Carl Lamley. Yeah, he was not. And, um, uh, but they generally were, were Republican. But it has to be said that Warner Brothers output as a studio was very left-wing and progressive compared to other studios. And True. The, the person is asking about the Remember My Forgotten Man number in Gold Diggers of 1933, I, I believe. Busby Berkeley does come up in your novel, yeah, uh, quite importantly, in the beginning of the book. Another relative of mine, my stepfather, <laughs> Erwin Gelsey, uh, was one of the writers for Gold Diggers of 33. <laughs> so uh, family is all over the place. The uh, Busby Berkeley musicals are used as kind of a counterpoint to the rise of Nazism uh, early on in the in Hill of Beans. Well, here's something really interesting. Um, what was Adolf Hitler's favorite movie? It wasn't Triumph of the Will. It wasn't anything by Lenny von Riefenstahl. It was 42nd Street <laughs> with uh, one of Busby's musicals. And what he what he loved, I'm convinced, and I say this in the book at one point, Goebbels says it sarcastically about him. The, these women, in scantily dressed women in, in high heels with their legs spread apart and the cameras zooming and turning women into automatons, right? Into mechanical parts of a machine, into cogs of a machine, dehumanizing women, but uh, being lavished by them, right? The film lavishing them and he underneath them, which I think is important. Those shots with the camera oh, yes. underneath oh. has to do with that terrible secret I talked about. Mm. So Warner, uh, um, <laughs> Hitler used to say he saw Tristan and Zolde 300 times. He must have seen 42nd Street 500 times. And um, everybody in Berlin knew about it. And I, I recall reading that he was a big Laurel and Hardy fan too. Of course, they weren't at Warner Brothers. Well, that's one of the nicest things I ever heard about. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Ginger Rogers, you can't really make her into an automaton, though. She's the it was the leader. chorus line. It was yes. the chorus line. Yeah. Um, okay. What's the next question, Adam? Here's a good one from Deborah Good. Uh, what was your process for inventing the voices, especially the German characters like Goebbels? FDR had a very distinctive manner of speaking. Could you hear him as you wrote? So how did I come up with the voices? Um, a lot of what Goebbels says is his own voice. That is, he wrote diaries, Tagebuchen, and um, much of what he says uh, about Jews, about life in Berlin, about, about actresses of various kinds, whom he liked or didn't like, about von Riefenstahl, those are his own words. And so I tried to make myself a ventriloquist and tried to capture in my, when, when I have him speaking in my words, I tried to capture his as he went along. And the same, the same for all the other historical figures. Patton, uh, Patton had a very distinct, aggressive, bullying voice. And so it was kind of easy for me. Maybe there's an aggressive bullying part of myself. Maybe there's a, uh, uh, you know, we, we uh, are whom we write to some degree. So it was not that hard for me, I think, to try and capture voices had, that had already been established. I think there's one question I wanted to highlight if I could, Adam. Mm -hmm. 
Someone writes in to ask about the source material for Casablanca uh, being a play by two writers named Murray Burnett and Joan Allison, and that's true. Uh, but your brother, your excuse me, your father and your uncle. They're asking to what extent they changed it, and I know I know that they changed it very, very significantly to the point that it has very little in common with that play. Yeah, well, you would know more than I, um, Scott, because I've never I've never read that play, but um, it is true that it was. But everybody comes to Rick's was the title of the play, and the basic idea was there. And to what extent? I mean, you say it was greatly changed. Uh, I, I don't doubt it. I'm sure that all the wonderful lines that we know, all of them are Julian Phil's. Except for the last line, which is, uh, Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. That's how Wallace's line. And there's a terrible line that Julie once told me belonged to Casey Robinson. It's a line, a frank for your thoughts. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I, I like when, uh, I like it when um, he says a frank for your thoughts. Bogart says that to Ingrid Bergman in the one of the yeah. Paris scenes. Julie said he's welcome to the line. <laughs> <laughs> or, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. Bogart says that to her, and she says, "Well, it's not even worth a franc." Or, or is it the other way around? I can't remember, but I like that scene. <laughs> and and um, the, uh, the the um, round up the usual suspects line in your novel, Jack Warner keeps trying to take credit for that, even though it wasn't his. Oh, no, that was, certainly was not his. And I mean, the the true story of that line is it's, uh, uh, as the myth, the mythology is right. They did not have an ending for the movie and they kept this person tried, that person tried. And one day my father and uncle who are, it's important to know they were identical twins, peas in a pod, were driving down Sunset Boulevard. And there was a, those of you who know LA, there's a red light at the Beverly Glen and Sunset. They were stopped at the red light and they turned to each other simultaneously and said, round up the usual suspects. And by the time they reached Doheny, they knew who, who, who had the gun. By the time they knew who got on the plane, by, and when they reached Burbank, went over Laurel Canyon into Burbank, they, uh, they had the entire ending. So I thought it was a gag for Jack Warner to keep thinking that uh, he, take, he takes credit for every good thing in the, in the, uh, in the movie all through the book. He takes credit for everything good in it at the same time as he thinks it's going to be a total failure and then it's a bad movie. Oh, he says, what a, as you heard when I just read this piece of crap, <laughs> you know, mm. I think I think murder in the, you know, in the tin mines, that's going to be a great success. Um, I wanted to just mention, if I could, I, I used to be, uh, I know a lot of people from uh, Boston are, are with us and I used to be projectionist at the Brattle movie theater for many years in the 90s. And uh, I had to run Casablanca many times as a projectionist. On Valentine's Day. Uh, on Valentine's Day and, uh, you know, twice a year for like a week at a time. And um, I listened to it so much, I came to know the entire screenplay without watching the film, just listening to it. You know who else did? The Harvard students. Yes. Because the film came, was successful, made some money and went. And then in the 50s, I think the early 50s, uh, was shown at the Brattle and the Harvard kids made a cult out of it. Yes. And they would repeat, you couldn't hear Bogart speaking because they would say the lines along with Bogart, Rick. Uh, and that's what brought the film back. So with, um, I'm very grateful to the Brattle and to those Harvard kids, now even older than I am, <laughs> who, uh, the, who who made the film a classic. That's right. The Bogart cult in America starts after <laughs> Bogart's death with the screenings of Casablanca at the Brattle during reading week at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how many Harvard students still go to that, but you know, I was certainly, I had to project it many times in the nineties. And I think I was telling you, it was funny because it was before I read your book, I was telling you that from listening to it so much, my favorite line in the movie became when Bogart says to the Bulgarian girl who's trying to flee to America, but she's gonna have to sleep maybe with Peter Lorre to do it. Um, she asked him what she should do, and Bogart says to her, you want my advice? Go back to Bulgaria, which may be the worst advice ever given to anyone in a Hollywood film in the <coughs> well, 1940s. When I hear, when I remember him saying, and as a true story with that, he says, put everything on 21. Yes, right. And, and that's because, and the true story, the true story of that is that my mother was in uh, Caliente, 
and at the casino and losing money and bitching and complaining. He had to know my mother to know. <laughs> and uh, finally, the, the croupier comes up to her and says, put your money on 21. She put it on 21. She got everything back. He said, now get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Julie and Phil uh, put that in the movie. And Adam, that, what, what, uh, let's let some people ask, the, ask some questions. Okay. Um, from an anonymous attendee, uh, what did they make? And by they, I guess they mean um, your father and uncle. What did they make of the cast? Were they happy with how their words were embodied? <coughs> what a wonderful cast. Um, so many of them were European refugees. The, I just mentioned the croupier. The croupier in Casablanca was the great Dalio, yes. Marcel Dalio, one of the great actors who ever lived. He is in maybe the two best movies ever made, A Grand Illusion and Rules of the Game. Plays a Jew in both of those films. He escaped by the hair of his teeth and came to Hollywood. And there he is playing the croupier. You're winning, sir. That's his line in the, in the movie. And so many of those actors mirror that story. Cuddles, as uh, CSO call, right? Um, almost everybody in the film uh, was a, a refugee. As, as Scott mentioned, only three of them were American born. I mean, that includes Bergman, of course, who was not German, but many of them were refugees. Paul Onreid was from Hungary. Um, it was, it's, it's one of the great cast uh, ever assembled. And we have to thank God, not Jack Warner perhaps, that Ronnie Reagan and Ann Sheridan <laughs> were not the ones who yes, at one that, point were considered. That famous role. story about Reagan almost starring in the film is <laughs> yeah. in the book. You know, when, when Marcel Dalio first appears in the movie, standing at the roulette table, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a shot of just him and he's speaking. And, for, and in that moment, Dalio is so good that he's like the star of the movie. You know, this is before he gives the money back to- He's uh, a, Claude, magnificent, a magnificent actor. Yeah, he's fantastic in that. And, um, you know, everyone's so good at it. Uh, every performance- He and his good. wife. Now, the woman who, who sings the Marseillaise, um, Madeleine LaBelle, it was his wife, and they broke up and divorced in the sh during the shooting of the film. Why? Because Mike Curtiz, who had an affair with everybody, also had one with her in the course of the film. And, and we see that happening on set in the course of the book. I mean, you know, Curtiz was famous in Hollywood and after for his malaprops and the way that he would mangle the English language when he spoke, yeah. uh, being a, someone who moved to the US from Hungary in the, in the late 20s, I think. When he got his Oscar for Casablanca, yes. he said, always a bridegroom, never a mother. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Adam, any, anything else for us? Oh, we got plenty. Um, Lisa Tadeo, um, I love Hill of Beans. Um, oh, there's another one I'm very proud of. Another, another graduate student, well, very proud of her book, Three Women. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, from Lisa, I love the Hill of Beans. Um, I'm curious to know who Leslie would think, um, who would like, Leslie would like to see direct its film version. Direct the film version. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Well, I'm, I, you know, am I allowed to say the words Woody Allen anymore? I mean, you're not allowed to even, you're not allowed, which I think is a terrible thing because he made such wonderful films. And I think in a, in a weird way, he would be very good for this film. Um, but now he's not, I mean, the films he made aren't even allowed to be shown in America. And this is a, you know, this is, I should say a word about this. Um, my book is going to have trouble uh, because of the cancel culture and the excesses of Me Too. Um, and it's, it's, not a, it's, it's inartistic, finally, and it's inhuman, finally. Of course, there should be equality between the races. Of course, there should be equality between the genders, and we should fight for that. But at the same time, you cannot apply the standards of one age to another. It's ahistorical. It's... It's a failure of imagination. It's a failure of humanity and would lead to the end of art. So what people have to have to appreciate art and I think to live as full human beings is you have to have an historical imagination. Otherwise, otherwise um, you know, the Red Guards will take over here as they did in China and it will be the end of art. 
so that I should be ashamed, a little bit ashamed, I'm not, but that others should feel qualms that I should mention. And perhaps I mentioned them just to get all this in, I don't know. Uh, a, a, a man who's given so much pleasure to Americans as Woody Allen and should be shunned so completely um, by something that's not, not proven. There's no court case or anything else. Yale says it wasn't true, Yale a panel. So um, I'll stick with my answer and, and say Woody Allen, though there are many other directors I admire a, a whole heck of a lot. The film has a kind of Coen Brothers quality. Yes, I admire the Coen Brothers too. Yeah. Very much. It's very, very much. funny. I'd be, like I'd be thrilled if they were interested in, <laughs> in, in, in making it. It's, it's similar in tone to their Hollywood movie, which takes place in the 50s. Barton Fink? No, not Barton Fink. Um, Hail Caesar. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, the character of Jack Warner is a very uh, sexist person. You know, he's not uh, a contemporary figure. But I don't think that anyone would want to cancel your your book because of Jack in in your in Hail of Beans. Well, well, not, and not anyone who has an historical imagination. Yeah. <laughs> but I f I fear many do not. <laughs> David Fincher just directed a movie, kind of right, Mank. Isn't that kind of similar to? Uh, no, it was about sort of No, I don't think that came off well. So yeah. I, I admire David Fincher a whole lot, the whole whole lot as a filmmaker, but somehow Mank, he, he, I think he made that film as a tribute to his father and the screenplay, and the screenplay didn't cohere enough to make that a su successful movie. Okay. The That's Upton Sinclair business didn't meld with the Orson Welles conflict with Mank, and, the, and that conflict itself wasn't followed through. So I'm very sorry to say that I didn't think it was a success. I didn't see it, sorry. <laughs> What did you um, think, Scott? I mean, I, I actually haven't watched Mank yet, and I haven't watched it yet because I'm worried about the false claims uh, made by the screenplay. But I will see it, you know, I will see it before the Academy Awards, I'm let sure. Me, let me know what you think. Yeah. Um, here's uh, from another um, anonymous attendee. Uh, how much is true and how much is you, or does it matter? I'll be right back. How much is, well... It's a good question that I don't know the answer to. You know, when you, when you have a dream, it's all you at night, right? And you can have terrible figures in your dreams and very frightening ones, but you know, it's some aspect of yourself. It didn't come from the clouds. You, you dreamt it up out of your own experience, transmuted, transmogrified even. And I think the same is true for a writer. So that even when Hitler shows up, or Goebbels or Patton, these terrible people. I have to say it's part of myself that you struggle to separate yourself from and see objectively. Perhaps it's a way of curing yourself from that part of yourself that contains such people and such figures, you know, including even, even Hedda Hopper. To give a more direct answer to your question, though I think that's ultimately the real answer, to give a more direct answer, I would say the war stuff is very true. There was an invasion of Morocco in 1942, a successful invasion where alas, we had to fight our oldest ally, the French. All the patent material is largely true. Um, much of the Goebbels material is true. Stalin had a daughter we treated just as he treats her in the book. Um, much of what Jack, I would say all of Jack is true to his personality and to his character, though not everything he does in the book is true. It's a good question, though it's a very hard one to answer. Um, this is kind of a sort of follow-up to that. Um, I just lost it. There we go. Um, can you describe the process by which you research this book and also how you wove together the research with the narrative without overwhelming the storytelling? Yeah, that's related to the last question, isn't it? Um, I just began reading books. There are books, The Clown Prince, I think one of them. Oh, here it is right here, Clown Prince of Hollywood. That's a biography of Jack. Uh, has a lot of the sort of gags and things about his life, about his character. I went out to Los Angeles at the Motion Picture Academy uh, library. I went to university, a USC library. Librarians all around the country were wonderful. Those at BU were particularly wonderful. Thank you, Donald Altschuler, 
Thank you to the music librarians. At, um, there's a lot of music in the book, a lot of songs from the period. I did a lot of research through the, the terrific music librarians there. Uh, weaving it in, you know, you try it one way, you drop it, it doesn't work. You try and fit these facts into your imagination in the, in the process I described in answering the last question. Um, from Larry McKenna, um, what would Julius and Philip have thought about your book? They would have adored it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the book, I, I, uh, uh, a previous book was dedicated to Uncle Julie. And Uncle Julie, is my father's identical twin, seamlessly became my father. I was 13 when my father died. Uh, I dedicated another book to both of them. This book, I felt I should dedicate and did dedicate to my father, Philip. Awesome. Um, from uh, Dan Shaughnessy, uh, this is terrific. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, how long did you work on the manuscript? Uh, when you read it now, are there, are there still things you would change? I would say a couple years of research, um, Dan, and um, three or four years of writing, and then, and then unusually for me, a lot of rewriting. A previous editor of mine, the great Joe Cannon, who's become a wonderful writer on his own, just took the book away from me at one point, even though he wasn't gonna be my editor for this. He doesn't, he's not an editor anymore, he's a writer. And um, gave it back a week later with you know lots of suggestions and many of them I incorporated into the book. It wasn't a book that was fully in my control, Dan. Um, until until maybe until I finished the editing with a very good editor, Elise, at the um, University of New Mexico Press. She was a terrific editor for me there as well. And to answer what would I change, you know, the editorial process never ends. So I can say right away, I mean, there must be, oh no, I would have said that in a, a different way and so forth. Even in reading this little chapter tonight, I changed a word or two as I, as I went along. And Dan, I hope you're in, uh, I hope you're in uh, Fort Myers and basking in the sunshine. It's gonna be 10 degrees here tonight. <laughs> um, from David Farrick, uh, any historical figures that were considered but not included? Um, I'm sure there were, who got dropped along the way? Maybe various actors and mi more minor figures, but I think I, I stuck with Stalin um, maybe Maxim Litvinov I was going to give a voice to, but decided not that, I, that Stalin himself was enough of the Russian voice. So I don't, I don't, I'm not, a, I don't remember dropping any, any voices from that, Dave. Well, you know, one, one aspect of that I think that's very interesting about the novel is that Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman are not characters in the novel. Right. You see them. Yes. You see them on set. And, and Bergman actually uh, does have, um, she's in a, she's quoted throughout a, a long complaining about the Epsteins and about the script and stuff oh, yeah. in, a, in a head of column, in a head of hopper column. So we do hear her voice and you do see Bogart. And there are a number of scenes of the actual filming of the studio with Mike, Mike Curtiz um, directing. Um, from Mark Bernheim. Uh, if you have not written about Lindbergh, will you one day? Oh, I think Philip Roth has done that for me. <laughs> um, How many Lindbergh novels does, does the public want? <laughs> I mean, there is another, how about historical imagination? There's another terrible man, right, uh, politically. He was, a, he was a huge fan of Hitler and especially Goering, and he got pinned on his, you know, the, the highest honor from the Luftwaffe. And then he attacked the Jews right up to Pearl Harbor and said, America's being manipulated into war by the Jews and so forth and so on. And yet there was greatness in him. And then after Pearl Harbor, he behaved well, even nobly and took, uh, and took terrific risks. So are we to cancel Lindbergh? Of course, the right doesn't want to cancel him, but should we on the left cancel him? No, you have to take human beings for the complex figures that they are. Unless they run for president, like in the Roth novel. <laughs> yeah, well, that's fine. Um, from another anonymous attendee, what did Leslie's father and uncle make of Michael Curtis? 
I, I don't remember them ever talking, uh, but he directed a number of their films. And so they must have been, uh, did he direct uh, Mr. Skeffington? I think you know that, uh, Scott? No, I don't think he did. Um, I'm not sure who that was though, not right now. Yeah, if, if he did, then they produced it. They must have liked him a lot, but maybe he didn't. It's a good movie. Um, and it, and it, uh, brave, as I pointed out in its way, I think they must have thought he was, I mean, he was a terrific director and why would they think, why would they think he's not? I mean, you know, but pre-auteur, imagine Michael Curtis now in the age of the auteur. Um, he was a, he was a fine direct, he was a, the greatest assembly line director of them all, perhaps. Well, he's considered the great uh, exception to the auteur theory, you know. He was exceeded on the assembly line. Yes, yeah. the Casablanca is the, the, you know, Andrew Saris calls it the, the happy accident, you know. That's great, not because of Curtis. I'm sure many people would uh, argue against that, however. But your father and uncle worked for a, a lot of directors uh, who were under contract to Warner Brothers. They worked for Raoul Walsh, um, William Keeley. Mm -hmm. you know, they were they were employees and they did what they were told but they didn't do it happily and they didn't make Jack happy either <laughs> <laughs> is that story about the sign true when they changed the sign yes it is that's well that's a very funny they story didn't, you know, they put out a memo to the paper newspaper saying the sign ought to be I, I can briefly tell that story I mean, there was a strike at Warner Brothers by all the craft unions and Jack Warner in his ruthless way called out the cops with their clubs and their fire hoses and beat back the strikers. Uh, and the motto for Warner Brothers and a big sign outside the studio was Warner Brothers combining great picture, combining good citizenship with great filmmaking. Uh, it's the other way around, combining great, uh, good, great filmmaking with good citizenship. And the, Epstein's wrote to the paper said the sign ought to be changed to combining great filmmaking with good marksmanship. <laughs> yeah, so they were strike breakers, right? They were very opposed to the trade unions after World War II. Uh, Jack Warner, but not the Epsteins. No, not your, not your father and uncle. No, but Warner no they were important figures in yeah. the Screenwriters Guild. Right, of course. No, as, was, as was Ronnie Reagan until he, and the Actors Guild, until uh, he turned, uh, changed his mind. When he made some money and changed his mind. <laughs> Um, there's a question for Scott. Uh, Roddy Bogawa wants to know if you're going to do a novel next, perhaps. Roddy Bogawa, great, great film director himself. Um, I don't know, Roddy, maybe. <laughs> Can you get me in advance? <laughs> <laughs> That's the best answer. <laughs> hire um, me to write one. For, hire me to write a screenplay. <laughs> Uh, from Daniel Morris, um, Leslie, you spoke of the Epstein boys as working contract jobs, um, as having to perform creatively as assignments with deadlines. Could creative writing students today benefit from that view of creative writing as deadline work? You know, certain certain ones can, I think. Um, I just got an email today from the wonderful writer Elizabeth Frank, won the Pulitzer Prize for biography of Louise Bogan and she speaks of a of a current uh, European writer who thinks a lot of herself and uh, and the, the name for Liz's name for such people is authorines and um, I think it would be a healthy dose uh, for some people to think of themselves as writing to a deadline as I mean an awful lot of good work in America has been done on newspaper and film and other deadlines and a lot, of, a lot of work has not been done when people think of themselves as above the fray somehow and um, beyond criticism and uh, beyond criticism. So I think the, I think the answer, Dan, uh, is uh, yes, they, uh, writers could benefit. I mean, certain writers could benefit from that. I write everything on deadline. There you go. I'm, <laughs> I'm over three deadlines right now. I'm in trouble. <laughs> The, the film critic and projectionist Sean Burns has a question, I see, which is a good um, question. Why was there so much fog at an airport in the desert? Yes, well, uh, that was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but and people, people, people noted it at the, at the time. It was all done in the studio on the lot. The airplane was a, was a miniature, it was a, 
a miniature airplane. They had to have midgets, uh, now little people, uh, pretending to service the airplane. It was all, it was kind of a mistake. <laughs> the little people appear in the, are mentioned in the novel. Yes, that scene does. That's right. But yeah. I think they, I think it was foggy in that scene so they could hide the fact that the card was a, that the plane was a cardboard background. Oh, that's probably, that's probably true, not a mistake. And they didn't bother looking in the geography book. Yeah. Um, did they have an opinion of Hal Wallace from another attendee? Yes. Um, when my father died, I saw a touching letter uh, that my uncle wrote to Hal, thanking him for his condolences. And it was a letter written by a man truly appreciative uh, of Wallace. And you know, Wallace played, he doesn't get an, I mean, <laughs> at the Academy Award uh, ceremony, when the picture won best picture, uh, Hal stood up to get the Academy Award, and there was a yell in the, in the and uh, uh, and Jack Warner rushes down the aisle, steps on everybody's knees and toes, jumps up and grabs the Oscar out of Hal Wallace's hand, and in a way has to grab the credit for what's great in that film away from Hal Wallace. Hal Wallace made all the decisions. Hal Wallace decided who, what, who the cast was going to be. And, uh, and what lines would be in and what would be out. Um, so to, I mean, to answer the question, I can't imagine that Julie and Phil didn't ap appreciate the role that Hal played uh, in the film. Hal Wallace must have disliked working at Warner's because he left for Paramount as soon as he could. Not that long after. Yeah. Uh, I think we got time for uh, one more question um, from Carol Court. Uh, can you picture anyone other than Bogey and Berman uh, playing those crucial roles? Not only can I not, but no one else can because there have been innumerable attempts to redo the film with other actors for television. There was, a, for a while, it was a radio drama. For, and I think the reason it fails is not because the film is inimitable uh, and also inexhaustible. That is, I've seen it, I don't know, a score of times, 20 times. It's as fresh as it can be every time. I think many people have that experience, but it's also inimitable. And Bogey is so much a part of that character. It's unimaginable, isn't it, to think of anybody else in that role. And, and Bergman was so magnificent, too. There's a, there's a remake of Casablanca starring Pamela Anderson in the Bogart role. <laughs> a barbed wire. <laughs> so now, um, this is going to only take a minute or two. This is from very near the end of the book. And we mentioned the HU, the House and American Activities Committee. And um, Julie and Phil were liberals. They were never, never members of the Communist Party. I remember a debate in our house in 1948, who to vote for, who to vote for. And they were arguing, Wallace or Truman. And the first time I ever heard the expression, the perfect is the enemy of the good was in that discussion. Maybe they coined it because it, it goes back to 1948 in my mind. And they said, we're going to vote for Truman, not Henry Wallace. And I went out, I knocked, I knocked on neighborhood doors, including Gregory Peck's door, um, who was a fine gentleman and a liberal, to sign petitions for Harry Truman. And so the Julian Phil flew out to, to Washington, D.C. for the Committee for the First Amendment. And here's a picture of them. It's my father. Can, does that show up? Can you see? Move to yeah. the middle. This way? Yeah. So that's my father with a big smile and his identical twin, Julie, next to him with a Capitol dome, so recently assaulted by you know who and his minions, um, so recently assaulted uh, to testify for the Committee for the First Amendment. Bogart was there too. John Garfield was there and many others. Bogart had to apologize. He caved into pressure. So their names came up in the 1947 HUAC committee. And I'm gonna read a few actual lines from the committee and then how Julian Phil handles it. It's from quite near the end of the book, just a few pages from the end. The head of the committee, the chief investigator was a guy named Mr. Stri uh, Stripling. And the committee asked, now Mr. Warner, and they weren't all Southerners, but they might as well have been, right? <laughs> So now, Mr. Warner, you've indicated that you wish to include the writers Julius J. Epstein and Phyllis J. 
Epstein in the list of names you have supplied us. Jack turned in the Epsteins that he had all these feuds with, right? Do you feel that they too have introduced un-American communistic ideas into their motion picture scripts? Mr. Warner, yes, I do. Those fellows did very good work at one time, <laughs> but they fell off and they're always together. They are never separated. And I would like to add that their work habits are un-American too. Mr. McDowell says, I'd like to ask the witness a question. Go ahead, Mr. McDowell. Mr. Warner, during Hitler's regime, they passed a law in Germany outlawing communism and the communists went to jail. Would you advocate that same thing here? Uh, maybe it's a good idea, Warner says. I don't like that taken from the rich part, even if it goes to the poor. Mr. Stripling, may I return to the subject of the Epstein brothers? You may, Mr. Striplin. Mr. Warner, you said that the writers Julius J. and Philip G. Epstein introduced un-American language and ideas into their scripts for your studio. Can you give the committee an example of that kind of work? Warner, well, they, they always write the way the rich man is the villain. It seems to me they're un-American because they're always on the side of the underdog. Now, he actually said that <laughs> to be an, uh, he says, because it's side of the underdog. Besides, we already made that picture. The Adventures of Robin Hood, the greatest bandit the world has ever known. Well, they never met Harry. So what happened after that meeting is that the House on American Activities sent a subpoena to Julian Phil. And the subpoena read as follows. To Julius J. Epstein and Philip G. Epstein. Pursuant to a possible subpoena by this committee, you are required to complete the following questionnaire. It consists of two parts. Part A, are you now or have you ever been a member of a subversive organization? Part B, if so, name that organization. Sincerely, Robert E. Stripling, Chief Investigator for the committee. And that's written in, uh, November 1947, Philip G. and Julius J. Epstein, November 1947, Los Angeles. And this was their actual reply. Dear Mr. Stripling, we are happy to complete your questionnaire. In response to part A, are you now or have you ever been a member of a subversive organization? The answer is yes. In response to part B, if so, name that organization, the answer is Warner Brothers. So that's pretty much how the book ends. Um, I've enjoyed this very much. Thank you, Scott. Thank My you, pleasure. Adam. Thank you all uh, so much for coming. I hope you, if you read the book, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, it was a pleasure for me uh, and a pain, of course, it always is, but also a fundamentally a pleasure, finally a pleasure to write and I hope you get as much fun out of it as I did. Thank you so much, Leslie. Thank you, Scott. That was wonderful. Thank you. Congratulations on your book, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And, and all best luck to you with, and your terrific book, too. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everybody. Have a great night now. Take care. Bye-bye.